It's always nice to see Shannon cry. <laughs> Makes me happy. Um, how's everyone doing this morning? <laughs> well, there we go. Uh, Pastor Jeff and the team are not the only people who are leaving. This Thursday, we have a team heading out to Shweba. How many of you remember we did an offering for them a couple of weeks ago? You guys were exceptionally generous. We took in $10,000 which is amazing, amazing, amazing. But I know that on the, the day that we were taking up the offering, we kind of sprung that on you. A bunch of you try to give online via PushPay or our CCB app. And uh, we didn't have a container or a, an account set up for that. But this week, I wanted to just highlight that if you give via CCB, if you go there now in our drop-down menu, you will see that there's Shweba. Uh, we've got a space for that. And if you're somebody who likes to give via the PushPay app, the same thing, we have right over there our Shweba African Village and so if you're trying to give electronically and you couldn't, please do so. We need to raise $22,000 to accomplish everything we want to do there and see the vision. So we're a little, um, a little under halfway there. But if you were trying to give online, it's all up, which is wonderful. If you've got your Bibles with you, could you turn with me to the book of Proverbs? Would you give me permission to mess with some sacred cows this morning? <laughs> so... Mm, It's funny, we all want God to move, don't we? <laughs> One person. <laughs> Perhaps it's not as funny as I thought, but we, we all want God to move, don't we? Yeah. It's just that sometimes he requires things of us in order for him to move. And that's when things get a little uncomfortable. I think it's interesting that the most powerful person in the universe was hindered from doing what he wanted to do because of the unbelief in the village that he was in. It says because of their unbelief, he could only do a few miracles. Over the days that we can only do a few miracles. But their corporate unbelief prevented him from doing what he wanted to do. So my question this morning is, what if there's things in our lives that are preventing the very thing he wants to do in our lives? Wouldn't it be good to identify those things? Wouldn't it be good to get rid of them? Some of you are like, I don't, I don't know, what are, you, what are you talking about? Well, stay with me. Let's start in Proverbs chapter 4. Let's pray first of all. Holy Spirit, would you help me? Would you uh, just illuminate your word this morning? Thank you for the gift of the Holy Scriptures. And Holy Spirit, would you come and would you anoint me? Would you make me brilliant for your name's sake? And would you come and join with us this morning, Lord? Would you light upon our hearts? Would you... Open our eyes, give us ears to hear, and may they put down their stones in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 4. We know that Proverbs was written by the wisest man that lived at the time, King Solomon. And they're brilliant. There's 31 chapters, one for each day of the month. And I find this, fas this passage fascinating because he says this. He says, above all else, just stop there for a second, wisest man in the universe at the time, writing stuff down. And he says, hey, above all else, above everything else, the number one priority in your life, at this point, we should be like, what's he going to say? And he says this, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. The number one priority that we should be having is guarding our heart. I find it interesting that Jesus said that it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of him. Because out of the heart, the overflow of the, out of the mouth, the overflow of the heart speaks. So Jesus is just saying, hey, the heart is a big deal. And so King Solomon here is saying, pay attention to your heart, guard it. I love the way the New Living Translation puts it. It says this, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. If you're not going where you want to be going, it could be an issue of the heart. Elsewhere in Proverbs, Proverbs 15, 15, Solomon says this, amazing verse. For the despondent, every day brings trouble. But for the happy heart, life is a continual feast. Your outlook will determine the day you're having. How many of you remember Winnie the Pooh? <laughs> Eeyore was always having a bad day. Tigger, always having an amazing day. We get to choose the climate under which we live. 
And it's a matter of the heart determining the course of our life. So it's interesting. We're supposed to guard our heart. My question is, guard it against what? What are we supposed to guard it against? Well, I'm no rocket surgeon, but I think we're supposed to guard it against things that could be stolen. Turn with me to the New Testament, to John, John 10.10. This is the passage in Scripture where Jesus gives a job description of what Satan does and what he does. This distills it down. It is amazing to me that Christians who've known Jesus for a long time still get these two things confused. Jesus said about Satan, he said, the thief is only there to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. Do you know sometimes we attribute stuff that's been stolen from us, stuff that's been taken from us, and stuff that's been destroyed to the work of God? Oh, he's testing me, he's building my faith, he's, you know, whatever. You're like, no. Read John 10.10, that wasn't the Lord. It's got all the hallmarks of the enemy right there. Jesus said, I came so that they can have real and eternal life. More and better life than they ever dreamed of. My question for you this morning is, what's the quality of your life like? Is it better than you ever dreamed of? If it's not, you might be living way below the glorious standard that Jesus expects for you in Scripture. Some of you know that I forget who, which stories I've told to which group, so forgive me if you've already heard this. When I was 21, I had a nervous breakdown. My sympathetic nervous system stopped doing its job I started hallucinating, I stopped being able to sleep, I started hearing voices, I was suicidal. I couldn't sleep at night. When I'd close my eyes, all I'd see is colors and I'd uh, just see the alphabet and in French and in English. And uh, I mean, literally my brain was like this hyperlink. I'd think of one thing and I'd think of a million other things. And I was an absolute mess. I probably should have been hospitalized. And after a couple of months of this, I spoke to my parents, I went to see my doctor and they helped stabilize me. And that was great. I remember the very first day that I felt like something had shifted. But here's the deal. For two years after I got stabilized, I was a shell of a person. I had none of the symptoms of despair and anguish and depression. But I didn't know who I was or where I was going. And even though I wasn't feeling this, I'd often wake up in the middle of the night in cold sweats, panicking. And beside my bed, I'd keep this jar of verses that I had written down on little sheets of paper about fear. Whenever I'd wake up, I'd grab one of them and I'd just read it over and over and over again. And on my jar, I'd written anti-fear pills. I'd just grab these and I'd hold on to them for dear life. And I remember one night waking up, it was about two o'clock, drenched in sweat. I grabbed one of these things and this thought went through my head. The thought was this, I cannot believe that this is the quality of life that Jesus' death on the cross was to produce. I can't believe that this is what Jesus died for. Now remember that verse where Paul said, having given us his only son, now will he not give us so much more. And I remember this verse, I've come and give you life and life abundant. And I remember saying to Jesus, I saying, Jesus, I am barely living life. Forget life abundant. I feel like I'm holding on by my fingertips. I am surviving. I'm nowhere nowhere near thriving. And I said, Lord, I refuse to believe this is the quality of life that you paid for. Now, those days seem like a million miles away. But I had to unlearn a whole load of things about God before I could learn a whole load of things about God. My question today is, it looks like the enemy is out to steal some stuff. And our job is to guard our heart and ensure he doesn't get it. The thing I love about Jesus, as we've been singing about this morning, is that he makes all things beautiful. And he loves to trade. He's constantly into upgrading our life. He loves to trade old for new. Do you know in Isaiah 61, the passage that foretells his coming, in the first seven verses, there are five insteads. He's like, you have this, but I'll give you this. Oh, you have this? Oh, I'll totally give you this. Listen to them this morning. These are some of the things that are inherent in our salvation. He wants to give you a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Anywhere that your life just looks like filled with ashes, stuff being burnt to the ground, and you don't even have a trace or a semblance of what it was or who you were, 
The heart of God is not that he'd sweep up those ashes, but he'd give you a crown of beauty instead. How about the oil of joy instead of mourning? You know, when you're in mourning, the last thing you think about is being happy. But the oil of joy ensures that it's not something you think yourself into, it's something you arrive at. But a garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. Instead of your shame, you'll receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. You know, I said that my life back then was a million miles away. I don't even recognize the person that lived like that. In fact, if you were to come back to me in the midst of my despair, I didn't have faith for the next day, let alone 20 years. But he's so good at making all things new. We just have to be careful that we don't oppose him in the process. The thing that I think God is most interested in upgrading us from this morning, and the thing I'm most worried that you're going to throw stones at me about, is this little sucker. I think God would love to say, hey, I see your cynicism, and I'd like to raise you. We'll talk about what he's going to trade you in a second for, but let's talk about cynicism. It's an inclination to question whether something will happen or whether it is worthwhile. If we had a sliding scale of bad stuff, cynicism is two stops past unbelief. Cynicism is a culture or a way of living that you've agreed to embrace unbelief, probably out of protection, self-preservation. And I know this because I lived with cynicism as a roommate and a close friend for many, many years. I found that cynicism is usually conceived in hurt. And then it's fostered in negativity. And when fully grown, stunts all life and growth. Yay, it's a happy Sunday. <laughs> Can I just say there's no redemptive value in cynicism? For those of you who are thinking, I want my demon of cynicism, you can keep it if you want, but it doesn't make a good pet. <laughs> the great thing about cynicism is it always delivers what it promises. It is so faithful in its outlook to ensure that we stay miserable. See, I know this because I grew up in a culture and in a climate of cynicism. Now, you all know that story about how to boil a frog who just keeps turning up the temperature and soon it you know, doesn't jump out. For years, I thought the culture I grew up in was normal, just like the culture you grew up in was normal to you. I thought I was totally normal. Didn't, didn't think of us as negative, didn't think of us as critical, didn't think of us as a cynical or a skeptical culture. But then I had the great privilege of moving countries. I moved to Canada, and I lived in Toronto, and lived there. It was only, I'd been there for maybe two years, was it, before I went back. And when I came back to the nation that I had lived in, I was like, good feelings gone. And I realized our newspaper, our entertainment, everything in the culture that I grew up in was really rooted in cynicism. We were proud of our cynical nature. What does that do? Well, listen to some real life exchanges I had growing up. I'm thinking of starting a business. Pfft, do you know how many businesses fail in the first year? It's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. I'm thinking of buying a car. What's the point? The only breakdown. It's the most expensive way to lose money. I'm thinking of visiting America. What's the point? You'll probably get mugged or shot. <laughs> I think I'm going to go skateboarding. You'll only break your leg. I mean, this was just the, like, this was the mirror of everything that you could see in your life was something of negativity and cynical thinking. When you grow up in a culture of doubt, in a culture of fear, and a culture of pessimism, you stop identifying statements like these as cynical or negative. Begin to think of them as reasonable. You make a good point, actually, statistically. I mean, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Worse yet, left unchecked, you begin to confuse those statements with wisdom. That's not negative. It's just how the world works, you know? You can have any world you want. To the despondent, but to the happy heart. 
See, I don't want to live in a world filled or laced with cynicism or negativity. Don't actually want to be in a church that embraces that either. Because the kingdom of heaven is one of relentless optimism. It's so offensive. Like, seriously, it's just like exhausting. Have you ever been around Michelle? Michelle, who's on the video? Like, she's just relentless in her optimism. Just, just constantly enthusiastic about everything. I'm like, oh, come on, be a bit more cynical. Get a bit more jaded in your Christian walk, please. No, she's just so obsessed with the beauty and the majesty of Jesus that it's amazing. Here's the thing, Jesus is like that. He's the most optimistic person I've ever met. He's relentless in his enthusiasm. He actually thinks he's God. <laughs> You're like, no, let me explain to you why this will not work. He's like, behold, I'm standing on water while you're explaining this to me. Continue. <laughs> ah! And the Holy Spirit is just as bad. <laughs> He's just like, I got a great idea. And you're like, okay, why do I have a bad feeling about your great idea? It's going to be amazing. We're going to totally take the world. Okay. See, we're called to bring heaven to earth, and heaven is not a cynical place. Jesus' whole ministry on earth had no cynical edge to it. I read through the Gospel of Matthew last night trying to find a cynical part of Jesus, but there wasn't. All I found was utter confidence in his Father's affection for him. Jesus was the person he was because of the Father he had. So even when he had bad news, like his friend John the Baptist being beheaded, you see, the first thing he does is go off to be with his Father. And as he's there in his time of grief and just being with his father, what happens? Multitudes come to him. And he's not like, hey, guys, time out. Like, I'm the boundary king here. Please just stop, okay? Away with your, you know, feed yourself. There's an Aldi down the road. No, he decides to feed them out of his compassion. Do you know even the Pharisees, the people who he clashed heads with the most, the people who caused him most grief, the people who were constantly opposing him, Although he had negative things to say about them, he did not write them off. Listen to this beautiful verse. Think, hold in your mind the friction, the misunderstanding, the frustration, the thorn in the flesh that the Pharisees must have been to Jesus' public ministry. And listen to this verse, Matthew 13, verse 52. We find this in the context of Jesus speaking to his disciples. One example after another about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And as almost a... I don't want to say a throwaway statement, but it says this. Then Jesus added, every teacher of religious law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings from his storeroom new gems of truth as well as old. He had hope that even the people who butted heads with him, the people who wanted to kill him, would come to their senses and enter the kingdom of heaven. And he honored them for what they already knew, the storehouses of old and the revelation they'd received. Nothing cynical, nothing negative about him. He was just like, oh, the kingdom is here and it's amazing. I was thinking about cynicism the other day and I was found it interesting that we're only cynical about good things. We're never cynical about negative things. We just instantly agree with the negative thinking. But positive thinking, promises, hopes, prophetic words like, ah, oh, you know, I don't know. How come we're never that suspicious when it comes to bad news? Yeah, I guess that's going to happen. We're all going to die and it's the end of the world. Wait, 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 wait. We don't even have a jury to hear this thing out. So I got to thinking, how is it we're never negative about negativity? And it's because you can't replace a negative with a negative, we've got to replace it with a positive. So what's the positive that God wants to trade you for cynicism? I think it's wonder. See, wonder is only accessible to the childlike. And all through the book of Matthew, when I was reading it, Jesus commends the childlike. It says the childlike will see the kingdom of heaven. Childlikeness is abhorrent to cynical thinking. It's scandalous, it's offensive, it's like a red rag to a bull. The problem 
that people will tell you is that wonder is totally unreasonable. Of course it is. It's wonder. <laughs> I like the way Albert Einstein says it. He's a bit of a genius. Just a little. He said this, imagination is more important than knowledge. For knowledge is limited to all we know and understand. While imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever will be to know and understand. Not that I want to put words in Albert Einstein's mouth, but I'm going to. If we were to swap out the word knowledge for reason, how about this? Imagination is more important than reason, or wonder is more important than reason. For reason is limited to all we know now, all we now know, all we something, and understand while imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever will be to know and understand. I did a word study on reason, not just the English word reason, but the root Hebrew and Greek words that we understand reason to be in the New Testament, the Old Testament. And I was amazed at the results. What's funny is that almost always the fruit of reasoning is error. So in the New Testament, the most common time you find reason and reasoning is the Pharisees are reasoning against him. And almost immediately the next verses said, Jesus, knowing their reasoning, said to them, why do you say X when Y? And they're like, Ooh. their reasoning got them to the wrong conclusion. Look back in your life and the times that God moved miraculously, I bet you a million dollars reason wasn't an ingredient. In fact, there's probably a million reasons why this should never work. And yet it did. I'm not down on reason at all. But I think there's a better way. But before we move on from reason, I want to show you the one time that I found that God reasons with us. And it's a magnificent verse. It's beautiful. It's found in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. It says this, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? The Lord, whose thoughts are not like our thoughts, is like, hey, I just want to reason with you. Hey, let's just sit down and talk. Let me explain something to you. Let me, let's just reason together. Although your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And though your sins are like crimson, they'll be wool. I want to make two points about this verse. The first point is, none of what he said is even remotely reasonable. <laughs> as we'll see later. When, when has it ever been reasonable that the most just person in the universe says, I'll take care of all your injustice, all your sin, all your heart. I'll, I'll make it right. That, that's not fair. That's not reasonable. That's not right. That's absurd. That's extravagant. First point. Second point is the only time that I found that God talks about reason is referring to our past. What happens once he's dealt with your past? Well, that's where the fun begins. See, when it comes to your future, God leaves reason behind and asks you to use imagination. I'm going to share a couple of verses with you. This is from Isaiah 55, verse 8. He says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. How about Ephesians 3, verse 20? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power, that it is work within us. The reason it's immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine is because God's goodness can't be contained. His goodness towards you today is fast approaching the level of fantasy. His kindness to you 
is at levels of outrageousness and absurdity. And that offends us because we like God in a box. But it's who he is and what he's like. He's extravagant in all his ways. I remember, you've heard us teach, I'm sure, or heard someone teach on the parable of the prodigal son. And Jesus told this story to demonstrate what the father's like. So when the son comes back from squandering his inheritance, from insulting the father, insulting the culture he was raised in, the father doesn't give him a good talking to and explain where he went wrong. No, he covered him with extravagance. The listeners of the day would have been in horror, in shock, and in awe of what Jesus was trying to teach them about the Father. Now, here's a contemporary example. It's nowhere near as good as that, or it would have been in the Bible. But I remember a number of years ago, I needed a new laptop. And my laptop had broken, and so I'm doing some research. And like I always do, I have a spreadsheet open. of I've got what I would love what's reasonable, and what I can afford, right? My three tiers. And I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe if I do this and I sell a kidney, I could get this, and, you know, do we need both kids? And, you know, I'm just, like, working through, like, what I've got and, you know, our resources and what we can get. And so I'm realizing that, you know, what I need is about $1,500, and that would be amazing, but how's that ever going to happen? I haven't even left the building of faith yet. I'm just in the dungeon reasoning myself out with the fact that God could ever invade and be good. And a couple of weeks later, a friend wrote to me and said, I was praying for you. And I felt like the Lord said he wanted me to help you buy a com- you know, some computer equipment. And I was like, that's amazing, because I hadn't told anybody. He's like, yeah, so you're going to be getting a check. So I was like, that's an- God, you're amazing. You're extravagant. And you're wonderful. And I just love you. And I always knew you'd come through. Totally did. And yeah, I'm out of the dungeon. And I'm like, woo, yeah, goodness of God. And I get the check. And I open up the check. And the check is for $15,000. So I'm thinking, this is a test. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just blow out of the water. I'm going to pass this test. I'm going to reverse tithe. I'm going to take the $1,500 I need. I'm going to give the rest away. And the Lord was like, you could do that. I'd really prefer you don't. And I was like, what? And he's like, actually, Alan, it's interesting to me that the first thing you do when I come towards you with affection, is you try and moderate me. And I was like, good feelings gone. (laughs) (laughs) So it's interesting that you've been raised with such a, whatever that is. Thank you. Poverty mindset. With a you know, you know, let's just, you know, checks and balances and, you know, and the Lord was like, actually, it would be really good and really helpful for our relationship if you would just go to the Apple store and just spend the whole 15 grand. I was like, Lord, I will be obedient. I will be obedient. (laughs) One of those and eight of those and six of those and three of those in different colors. Because the Lord was saying, hey, Alan, the journey I want to take you on is not theoretical. I don't want to talk to you without demonstrating who I am. And it cost me so much emotional energy to spend $15,000. Because I just thought, well, you know, well, what about this and what about that? And blah, 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 blah. See, the son, when he came home, was just like, you know what? I can just be a servant. I don't even want to be, I'm not worthy to be your son anymore. I'll just work if you could just give me food. And, the, and that's the way we approach God. God, if you could just, you know, ah, ah. and the Lord's like, are you kidding me? I didn't sacrifice the only person I had in the whole world, the person I loved the most, to get you into my family, to give you a glorious inheritance, to give you my Holy Spirit in you so that you could be like, could I? He's extravagant. He's unbelievable. And we spend so much time in reasoning who he's not that we forget to wonder who he could be. First Corinthians 2.9. No eye has seen And no ear has heard and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. See, just beyond your imagination, you begin to find the plans that God has for you. We like to interpret what God has for us within the confines of what we understand is happening right now. 
It makes it really difficult for God to do monumental changes in your life when we're thinking in incremental stages. Graham Cook says this, there's a way of thinking that is far above logic and reason. God is much too clever to be an intellectual. Let me go back to reason, what's reasonable, what's fair. You know, I said in that passage in Isaiah, I said, you know, the first thing is when God says, let us reason together, hey, though your sin is like scarlet, I'll make it white as snow. And we go, oh, yeah, that's great. Well, we go like that post-cross. Like we just got accustomed to the revelation that changed the whole world. But it's actually not reasonable at all. What's reasonable is that we die for our sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We have a friend who was praying one day. He was really upset because an event had happened in his life that had nothing to do with him, but the outcome of that event greatly affected him. So he was like, Lord, I, I don't even know what to think. Like, this is crazy, and I'm so upset. Lord, I just need you to help me. And I'm struggling because it's just not fair. And the Lord said, oh, oh, do you want what's fair? And he's like, yeah, I want fair. And the Lord said to him, then go to hell. Because hell is what's fair. We spend so much energy trying to get to the level of fairness, and yet God's up like 10,000 feet from fairness in abundance and extravagance, and we wonder why we can't hear him. So much of our thinking revolves around Jesus paying off our debt. And that's amazing. Like, I mean, seriously, I'm not demeaning the work of the cross. Like what Jesus did in paying for our sin is unbelievable. But it's only half the equation. I think as evangelicals, we've only plumbed half the depth of what he's done for us. We don't realize that, yeah, he's paid off our debt of sin. But he's also given us a down payment, the wonderful Holy Spirit of what's to come. And he wants to share his inheritance with us among the nations. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations. When was the last time you asked for a nation? I'd settle with a cheeseburger and a sweet tea. <laughs> you know, with all he's done, we can't afford to think cynically. But with all he wants to do, it's perilous to hold on to our cynicism. I want to just show you a passage from the life of Israel. This passage here appears, they've just been set free from 400 years of captivity as slaves in Egypt. Miraculously, the 10 plagues has just happened. The parting of the Red Sea, this is what we're talking about. And there's no food and the Israelites are grumbling. And so they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Like how quick we forget the provision of God. Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us up out of Egypt? Is it not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Too often we're more comfortable with the cold grip of unbelief than we are in the new territory of expectation. At least I know what I had back there. Just leave me alone to die. It's funny because by day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud. And at night they had a pillar of fire so that they could travel by day or by night. And so this horror attitude is happening in the midst of signs and wonders. See, we often think that signs and wonders would help us in our decision-making process. Signs and wonders are great. But at the end of the day, signs and wonders won't change your mind. Only you can change your mind. I've seen people who've performed miracles walk away from the Lord. The miraculous isn't the problem. It's the unguarded heart that is. See, Judas, he followed Jesus faithfully for three years, saw everything firsthand 
and yet sold out the Lord. Let's get to happier territory. John chapter 5, verse 20. For the Father loves the Son, and He shows Him all things that He Himself is doing. And the Father will show Him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. You and I were built to marvel. We're built for wonder. And so the fact that I've been so content for so many years to live in cynicism is astonishing to me. Graham Cook had this to say when he's here with us a couple of months ago. He said, when you believe a lie, you empower the liar. Stop opposing God with your own thoughts. If that was ever a word of the Lord for the church today. Stop opposing God with your own thoughts. Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And that means he has overcome all negative thinking. So this is your homework this week. You get to set aside some time to wonder. Here's the brilliance of God. You're never too late to pick up where he is. Because some of us are like, man, yeah, I needed this message like a year ago. I needed this message five years ago, 10 years ago. Hey, you know what? He's brilliant. He makes everything beautiful in his time. So you can just say, hey, you know what, God? I'd like to get back on the wonder train. I'm just tearing up my ticket of cynicism. Habakkuk chapter one, verse five says this. Look among the nations. Observe. Be astonished. Wonder. Because I'm doing something in your days that you would not believe if you were told. So my question is, what is God just brewing in your heart that you have the choice to wonder about, to fan into flames, or equally to just criticize, push down, suppress, because it's not reasonable? What's he doing corporately in our midst Look at the prophetic words. Have you read the prophetic words we have over our city and over our church? It's just like, what? Habakkuk 1.5, that's what it is. I remember many, many years ago, I was a school teacher in Edinburgh. I I wasn't in ministry. I hadn't gone to Toronto. I just lived and I worked and I taught school children, which was a lot of fun. God bless all the teachers who are here. And so I'd get up and go to work. I'd teach children that didn't want to be taught. And I'd come home and, and on Thursday nights, I'd spend time with Jesus And one day, you know, the Lord started prophesying over me in my bedroom. And I was just like, Lord, this is amazing, but I'm having a hard time handling it. Could you speak to me about it? And the Lord's answer surprised me. He said, Alan, you think Coke in glass bottles is awesome. (laughs) And I was like, what? He's like, the level of awe that you have is like, Coke in glass bottles, this is amazing. He's like, we're gonna need to do some work to expand your container of awe to fit in what I want to tell you. And he said, you would not believe if I told you. And he said, and that would be a problem for our relationship because you'd basically be calling me a liar. (laughs) He's serious about that, apparently. So it's like, well, Lord, I don't want to call you a liar. And he's like, then you got to expand your horizons for what I could do. See, before I ever went to a nation, he told me to go to nations. Before I ever saw deaf ears open, he told me I'd see it. Man, I just wrestle with that. Before he'd ever tell me that I would go around the world and teach people how to hear God's voice and blah, 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 you know, all the stuff, I was like, how's that ever going to happen? Like, it's my job to make that happen. (laughs) Our job is to meet the Lord with humility and meekness and just agree with him. Oh, that we would just agree and just say yes. My gosh, that would propel us forward. But instead, we're like, ah, I'm not even sure that's you. I don't think so. I need to do this. I need to do that. And how's that ever going to happen? And we reason our way out of him. We oppose him with our thoughts. What's great about now is I have, as you do too, a history with God that you can look back and go, oh, you met me there and you met me here and you met me there. The reason David was so confident he could take Goliath was because the Lord had already shown him he could take a lion and a bear. So we want to use our past breakthroughs with God and apply them to our future breakthroughs. Can I throw out something for free? Your prophetic words are best understood in hindsight. So you get a prophetic word today, I guarantee you it will make no sense. 
Have fun working out what it means. But five years down the line, you look back and go, oh, you're a genius. That's what you were talking about. I was a play on words. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> but when we stand here and we have a prophetic word and we're trying to work out what it means, we're kind of like, eh. That's why scripture says don't despise prophetic words. I'm going to read a verse that all of you are familiar with when the Lord is telling his disciples about what's going to happen to him and how he's going to be handed over and crucified. And, and Peter just says, no, 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 no. This is never going to happen. No, 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 no. Negatory, good buddy. And the Lord says this to him. Matthew 16, verse 23, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me because you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. See, humanist thinking, rational thinking, it'll get us to a certain level, but at some point if we rely on it, we're actually listening to the voice of Satan. And we begin forgetting what God is saying about a scenario. So in our wonder, be careful what doors we open. I want to leave you with two verses that Pastor Jeff, for me, for this year, the two verses that he's just drilled into my spirit. Is, they're very similar. The first one says, consider carefully what you hear. So what's going into you? What are you listening to? Who are you listening to? I'm spending an awful lot of my time untangling bad teaching that should never have been listened to in the first place. In the lives of people I pastor, I'm like, what? What the heck? Why did you think that would be a good book to read? Like, seriously. Facebook is powered by suspicion and bad news. Like, it totally is. That and pictures of cute children. All right? Sometimes I'm not sure which one's worse. Okay. Sorry. I was cynical and negative. I apologize. <laughs> How many of you remember the avian flu? How about the H1N1 pandemic that was going to wipe out America? How about Y2K? How about the Shemitah? So we hear bad things and we jump on them because they confirm all our worst fears. We don't take stock to say, hey, maybe God has an opinion on these things. Maybe he's big and maybe these words don't fit in with his plans to bless us and to give us a hope in the future to not bring calamity. Yeah. I love Bill Johnson because he's a genius and he said this. He said, we stay encouraged by focusing on what God is doing, not on what he seems to not be doing. We are to feed on his faithfulness. I'd like to suggest that it's gonna be very difficult for us to go where God wants to take us, both individually and corporately, if we're scared to believe the best and used to believing the worst. We have to do an audit on what we're listening to, who we're listening to, and how we're listening. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. How do you hear things that are coming to you with suspicion, with caution, with eagerness, with anticipation, with negativity, with doubt, with skepticism, with hope? It's important we refuse to feed our soul on anything that competes with the truth that God is good. Actually, the first thing we need to do is come to a revelation that God is good. I remember when Bill Johnson was here at Voice of the Apostles and he stood up and he was talking about the four core values that they have at Bethel and he said, you know, one of our core values, an unshakable thing that we won't move from is God is good. He said, now, there's a room here of about 8,000 people. I'm sure every Christian in this room would nod at, yep, God is good. He said, but that's not enough. He said, because there's things in our theology and in our thinking that we apply to God's goodness that if we apply to other human beings' behavior, those people will be put in prison. So we actually have to have an unshakable confidence that all things work for the good of those who love him. We actually have to have a confidence that God has our best interests at heart and that he's good and that he's kind. So here's what I'd love to do this morning. 
is I'd love it if we could do an audit on cynicism. So what I'd love you to do is just quiet your heart. I'm going to ask Jesse to come up and play. Just quiet your heart and think about the prophetic words that are written over your life. Or perhaps the invitation God's given you for a new direction, perhaps in work or buying a house or having more kids or schooling or whatever. What is the Lord speaking to you about? And what have you done with that revelation? Have you cradled it? Have you thrown it out? Because I find it interesting that both Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, had the same revelation and responded with the same question, but both had very different outcomes. So the question, how can this be, is a great question to ask. But I was like, how can this be? This is amazing. It's a world of difference from, <laughs> how can this be? So Jesse plays, and as I pray over us, just take an audit of your heart. What's your optimism level? What's your cynicism level? Is your heart sinking? Is your heart wandering? So Holy Spirit, right now in this place, would you come? Lord, I thank you, you're so gentle. That you never reveal anything to make us look bad. You never reveal anything to point and laugh at us. You only reveal things that you want to take and upgrade. So would you light upon us right now, Lord? Would you begin to move in our hearts? Would you begin to show us the things that you'd love to do, Lord? The promises that you have for us, the destinies you have for us individually and corporately. Lord, the next steps, the risks you'd love us to take places to go, people to connect with, steps of obedience, money to sow, Lord, whatever it is. And Lord, where our hearts have met you with, well, that will never work. Or how's that ever going to work? Lord, we corporately choose to repent of that thinking. And we cry out, Lord, like that, Father, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Lord, we want to inch along the spectrum towards hope, towards belief, towards a confident assurance that you are who you say you are and you'll do what you said you'll do. I wonder 
Forgive us for at times being like Israelites in the desert, complaining and not seeing what you've done. Forgive us in our zeal when we've been like Peter, correcting you on the way you should do things. Forgive us when we've been like Zechariah, who's questioning your ways. Lord, we just purpose in our heart to be childlike, to say yes to wonder, no to cynicism, we commit to just agreeing with you, Lord, and not opposing you. And Lord, you're so good, you're so great, you're so kind. And I'm asking, Lord, that this week that you'd come and you'd renew a passion in our hearts to be quick to obey you, to quick to believe you, and to be people who not only agree with your dreams about us, to find others to encourage in their dreams with you. Amen. Well, we have a ministry team this morning who would love to pray for you. They would find it an absolute joy if you would like to come up and just say, hey, I need encouragement in this area. Or, you know, I need someone to pray with me for faith for a new job or a new house or whatever. We have a team of people who are trained. They're all going to be wearing badges. They're going to be standing right behind me. You see them assembling right now. If you would like to receive prayer from our team this morning, please come and see Rob. He's standing right here. Uh, just work your way down this aisle over to see Rob and he'll uh, assign you to somebody who would love to pray for you. Thank you so much for being here at Grace Center this morning. We love that you're here. We will see you next Sunday. Have an incredible week. God bless you.